Hey guys, in this particular example I wanted to go over how to find a confidence interval and really what it means when you're trying to come up with a margin of error. So the problem that we're going to be working on is a Gallup poll organization in 2000 did a study and found that of 1,200 adults that were surveyed, 38% of them said that they believed in ghosts. Well, how do we know that that 38% is really an accurate reflection of the overall population? We're not, but we're fairly certain that around 38% is where the true population's proportion is. Well, the question is, is if we want to say that we're 90% confident that a certain interval would capture the real population's parameter, then we can actually use that 38% as a good starting point. So the first thing that we're going to do here is we first have to check and see, would this actual survey correspond to the required uh, the requirements for a sampling distribution. Well, the first thing that we want to notice here is that this 1,200 adults is definitely less than 10% of the entire population. So in our requirement check, what we see here is that yes, it is less than 10% of the population. The next thing that we want to make sure that we have is that we have 10 successes and 10 failures. Well, in this case, what we're talking about is people that believe in ghosts. So when we're talking about success here, we're going to say that of the 1,200 people, or 1,012 people that were surveyed, we know that 38% of them believe in ghosts. And when we actually do that calculation here, we actually find out that the total number of people that believe in ghosts is roughly 384. So Overall, we know that we definitely have 10 successes, and when we look at the failure rate here, we're going to do the exact same idea here of saying that 1,012 people that do not believe in ghosts, well, if 38% believe in ghosts, then I know that 62% do not believe in ghosts, and if we do that calculation very quickly on our calculator here, we actually see that there's roughly about 627 people that do not believe in ghosts, so we definitely have 10 successes and 10 failures more than that. So from there we can go on to the next part of the problem. The next part of the problem is actually creating the sampling distribution. So for our sample distribution model that we want to use here, what we're going to say is that we need to calculate the standard deviation. We also need to create a picture diagram that would show us what the sampling distribution might happen to look like. Well the first thing here is is that I know that we have this standard deviation formula here. And remember, for a sample population, what you actually want to do is you want to take your p hat and your q hat and put it underneath the square root, so p hat and q hat, and you are going to divide that by the overall sample size. Well, looking at that, we're just going to get the square root of our 0.38, and we're going to multiply that times our 0.62 all over the 1,000 12 that we have for our sample size here. And doing that calculation on the calculator, we get 0.38 times 0.62, dividing that by 1,012, and then taking that answer and doing the square root of it, we end up getting a standard deviation of 0 0.0153 when you round. Now at this point, we have enough information to kind of start looking at our distribution, but we don't want to use this particular standard deviation just yet, because remember, what we're wanting to actually look at is what is the overall distribution in terms of a confidence interval. So what you do is you actually do your drawing here. And when you do your drawing, what you're actually looking at is the center point right here. And you're going, okay, well I know that that center should be roughly around the sample statistic of 38% or 0.38. And what they're saying with a confidence interval of 90% is they're saying that you're going to go out to the right and you're also going to go out to the left and you are going to capture this entire area between these markings here and that that total area is going to be 90 percent. So what we're actually saying is is that this whole blue shaded area was would be 90 percent of the total area underneath this bell curve here. Knowing that that's what we want, what we really want to think about when we go to our Z table to look up our probabilities is really what's this area over here and this area over here. Well, again, 
knowing that the blue area here is 90%, that means that the remaining pink area between the two tails has to be 10%. So this whole area that is over here on the left, right here, has to be 5%. That also means that this has to be 5% as well. Now the reason this is important is because this 5% ultimately is what we're going to use and say, okay, I want this z-score right here. So what is this z-score? So looking at this, I can look at the left-hand side of that z-score and see that I get 90% plus 5%. And if I come over here to my z-score chart, my z-score chart actually says that, okay, at 95%, which is right here, that that is on the 1.6 line in the 0 0.05 column. So my z-score, positive-wise, is a 1.65. So this z-score right here is 1.65. And from that, what I'm actually going to do is work backwards using this standard deviation up here to calculate what this particular value is along the number line that has 0.38. So, bringing all this work up here and using my z-score formula now, what I'm going to say is, okay, we know that going from a z-score to data, what I want to do is I want to say I know that my z-score is equal to whatever my data point is minus the actual statistic that I'm using divided by the standard deviation. And then going from that and plugging in my values now, I can say, okay, I know that my z-score that I wanted to use was 0.165. It's equal to the data value that we used. Well, in this case, we don't know what that data value is. So we're just simply going to say that we don't know what it is. And what we're assuming here is that this 0.38 is the actual population's parameter. So we actually put the 0.38 right here all divided by the 0 0.0153 that we got from our standard deviation. Well, looking at that, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the 1.65 times the standard deviation, which is 0 0.0153, and from that we get this next step right here, which is saying that we get 0 0.02525 is equal to x minus 0.38. Well, if we add this 0.38 to both sides, then what we actually come up with is that x is equal to, in this case, 0.3 or 0.4 something, excuse me, so 0 0.02525 plus 0.38, and we end up getting 0.40 five two five. So now at this point we know this actual value right here along this particular line. So if I actually wanted to start making this a valid little point here, what I can do is I can come over here, pick up my eraser and say, okay, I know that that z-score was 0.165, but now that it's an actual data point, I can come over here, grab the right color and label it as instead of being that z-score now, 0 0.40. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say 5, and we'll kind of leave it at that because, again, this 0.38 is taken to only two decimal points. This should technically be to two decimal points, but we'll leave it as that for right now. Well, the nice thing about doing it this way is that, remember, the margin of error is actually defined as the distance that it would take to go from here to here. So from your actual samples statistic to this number right here. Well, if we look at that, the distance that we traveled there was this distance right here. That distance overall is basically that entire idea of taking the z-score that we got right here and then multiplying it by this standard deviation that we got right here. So really, if we wanted to make this very quick, we could say that our margin of error was equal to whatever our z-score was times the standard deviation. And this standard deviation is actually what's called the standard error. So knowing that now, we can say, oh, well, if we look at that number right here, which was the 0 0.02525, and convert it into a decimal, we could then say that really this standard error or margin of error 
is ultimately equal to 2.5%. And that's what our margin of error would mean. Using that to construct the confidence interval, that means that we get 0 0.405 here. And if we move in the negative direction from 0.38 and take away that 0 0.0252, we end up getting 35.4 over here on the other side, which would be this blue line that we see right here. 0.354. So looking at our overall confidence interval, we see that the lowest possible number that we can get is this 0.354. The highest number that we can get is the 0 0.40. So with 90, on a 90% 90 confidence interval, we are saying that the actual population parameter is somewhere between 0.354 and 0.405. So our actual population parameter, P, has to be somewhere within that range.